Hello, everyone. Welcome back and Happy New Year. Today's mythical creature, I'm going to give you some hints for. This mythical creature is heaven sent. It's often linked with fire or the sun. It's rarely one that visits earth, but when it is, it usually is a sign of a new era or peace or renewal. It's often associated with, in fact, a death and rebirth or resurrection. Can you guess who's this week for our mythical creature? Well, stick around because we're coming up with a new mythical creature. Come on, let's see who it is. Well, if you guessed a phoenix, you would be right. And there's a picture of what we oftentimes think of as a phoenix. Oh, and by the way, I forgot to point out to you, there's Bo Bear and Huckleberry in the background, and they've been celebrating their New Year's still with their little hats and, and blow toys. So I'll show you a bigger picture of them. Um, they'll hang around for a little bit this week. But anyway, there's our picture of the phoenix. Now there's lots of countries that have some sort of bird representation of what we think about as a phoenix. And I'm going to show you some pictures of those in just a little bit. This is more of what we think about a phoenix in a Western culture or an Egyptian culture. And um, Europeans thought of them looking more like that. There's also people in Japan and China that have um, cultures of a phoenix. And in Asia, the magical phoenix is thought to bring along good luck and peace. And so they only appear in Chinese tradition. Um, it's called a uh, Feng Huang, and it appears only at times of peace to announce the birth of a virtuous emperor. And so tales of birds, much like the Asian phoenix, are told in many regions of the world. And this is a picture of one that perches on top of a um, building. That's a roof charm. And here's a pretty picture of one from Japan. And it's considered the king of birds in Japan. They have beautiful, brilliant plumage. And this is a picture of a woodcut up here. That means they've, they've uh, cut into a, a thin piece of wood and then um, colored it. They're very pretty. Um, and the Japanese uh, consider this bird to be the king of birds. In an Asian legend, when a phoenix flies from heaven to earth, it likes to perch on a branch of the Paulonia or princess tree. Both the bird and the tree have been used as emblems in Japan in the Japanese empire. And this is a picture of a sword guard. It goes um, onto the sword um, just to protect the person's hand so they won't get cut. So this, the sword would go in right through these slots here. And isn't that beautiful? Very decorative. It shows a picture of the Polonia blossoms on the Japanese sword guard there, really pretty. And then the bird, isn't that beautiful? Right up above there. Well, the um, bird goes all the way back years and years and years. And uh, usually it shows up at the very beginning, long time ago, it looked like that in Egypt. And in Egypt, it was called a Benu. And the bird was pictured in hieroglyphic tablets, those stone tablets. And it was pictured like this as a long legged heron um, with two feathers on the crest. And oftentimes it had this um, headdress of Osiris, the god who dies and is reborn. And I think that's where this legend started of the bird. Um, you can see that lots of times we've talked about how these different stories get told over and over and kind of embellished as years go by. And so in this story with the Egyptians, it's linked to 
Uh, Bennu was the soul of the sun god Ra. And so there's where the sun gets linked in here. And um, so Ra was linked symbolically to the rising and the setting of the sun. And then the Greeks had this interpretation where the historian Herodotus describes the life cycle of the Egyptian phoenix, which he likened to an eagle with red and gold plumage. And so you've probably seen some of those pictures that look more like that. We kind of took more of the Western idea and that looked more like the picture that I first showed you. And he likened it to a red and gold plumage. And every 500 years, the bird comes to um, Heliopia, Helopolis and from Arabia and brings his father's ashes and he embalms the remains in an egg made of myrrh and deposits them at the temple of the sun and at the end of his life the bird builds a nest of incense twigs and lies down in it and dies and from the dead body a small worm emerges and the heat from the sun transforms it into a new phoenix so that's the way the Greeks told the story and then in the Middle, Egypt, Middle Ages, about a thousand years later, the story gets retold and added to a little bit more. And they said it, that the phoenix lives for upward of 500 years. And at the end of its life, it builds a pyre. That's like it builds a whole big mound of, um, of uh, sticks and um, out of aromatic twigs and it turns to face the rays of the sun and it fans the fire with its beating wings and it's consumed by the flames and from the ashes the new phoenix is born. So like the Egyptians the medieval Christian writers saw the myth as a symbol of resurrection and hope of life after death. So that's where that idea and image that I talked about at the very beginning of um, this idea of being reborn and having hope for life after death comes from. So we start to see these ideas emerge in different places. And I told you there was a Japan, there was a Chinese one. Isn't that beautiful? That's a picture of one of the Feng Huan ones is. Isn't that pretty? Now, I told you that there are different cultures that have the equivalent of a phoenix in different countries, and they're called different things. In Egypt, they were called the Bennu. In China, they're called Feng Huang. And in Russia, they're called the Firebird. So I want to read to you a very famous folk tale that the Russians like to tell about a prince and a horse and a firebird and a gray wolf. So come along with me as we read and listen to that famous folk tale. The story of the firebird. There was once a czar of Russia who had three sons and he was the richest czar of the kingdoms. He owned the most beautiful garden where he walked every day. In the garden, there was a large tree with golden apples, the czar's favorite tree of all. One morning, as he was strolling through his garden, admiring his gorgeous tree, the Tsar noticed that two of his golden apples were missing. I know there were two more apples here yesterday, he said to himself. I counted them all. The evening, he hid by the tree to catch the thief. I, he waited late into the night and finally saw that the light flashed across the garden. Surprised and stunned, he watched a large flaming bird alight on the branch of his apple tree. The bird's feathers were brilliant gold, so bright that the light hurt the Zyre's eyes. He was too awed to move, but whispered to himself, the firebird. The next morning, the Tsar told his sons that whoever could capture the firebird alive would receive half the Tsar's kingdom at once and the other half when he died. The sons swore to do their best, not for the reward, but because they loved their father. That night, the eldest son, Sergei, waited in the garden. The soft night air soon put him to sleep and the firebird came and stole two apples without even being seen. In the morning, 
Sergei lied and told his father that the firebird had never appeared. The next night, Dmitri, the second son, kept watch in the garden. He too soon fell asleep. The next morning, he also lied to his father, claiming that the firebird never came. The third night, Ivan, the son, third son, stood watch. He made himself uncomfortable and he started to become drowsy. He splashed water on his eyes. Suddenly, he saw a bright streak of gold. It was the firebird. As it perched on a branch to snatch the apples, Prince Ivan quietly moved closer. He made a grab for the firebird, but it was too fast and he only succeeded in grabbing one long, brilliant tail feather. The next morning, he told the Tsar his tail and presented the feather to his father. The Tsar was satisfied for a while because the firebird didn't come back to the garden. Soon, however, he became consumed with the feather and looked at it every day. He wanted the firebird so badly that he again told his sons that whoever could bring him the firebird alive would be given half his kingdom then and the other half at the death of the Tsar. The two oldest sons set out together immediately, but Prince Ivan waited for his father's blessing and set out on his own. Ivan rode for a long time until he came to a sign that said, he who continues this way, way shall lose his horse. But there was no other way to go. So Ivan continued in that direction, even though he loved his horse, after a few days, his horse dropped dead beneath him. A gray wolf was standing by the roadside as Ivan cried. The wolf said, Ivan, you so loved your horse. Why did you continue in this direction? Ivan told him the story and then continued on his way. Three days later, the gray wolf showed up again and offered to help Ivan. The wolf took Prince Ivan to Tsar Dharmat's garden where the firebird was kept in a golden cage. He said to Ivan, Prince, you must jump this wall and take the firebird out of the golden cage. Do not touch any part of the golden cage besides the spring. Promise me that you won't touch it. Ivan promised and hopped over the wall. Ivan immediately saw the firebird and took it out of the cage. He looked at the beautiful golden cage and thought how nice it would be to carry the bird in. But as soon as he touched the cage, alarms went off all over the garden and the palace. Guards jumped out, grabbed Ivan and carried him before the Tsar. He told the Tsar his story. Tsar Dharmat asked him why such a powerful Tsar had to resort to stealing instead of just asking for it. To redeem himself, Ivan had to do the Tsar a favor. The Tsar wanted the white horse with the gold mane and tail and told Ivan that he would give him the firebird if he would bring him back this horse. Ivan sadly walked out and told the gray wolf his story. The gray wolf consented to take him to the golden maned horse if Ivan would follow his orders this time. After a day of running like the wind, they arrived at Tsar Arvan's stables. The wolf pleaded with Ivan to follow his instructions carefully. Go to the stables, he said. Take the golden mane horse, but do not touch the golden bridle that is hanging on the wall. Ivan snuck into the stables where the grooms were sleeping and took the horse. As he was turning to leave, he noticed the golden bridle. It was so beautiful, he couldn't resist touching it. Uh-oh. As soon as he took hold of the bridle, an alarm rang out and all the grooms awoke and seized Prince Ivan. Tsar Arvon decided to allow Ivan to redeem himself by bringing Helen the Beautiful to him. She was the most beautiful Tsarina, that's the name for a Russian princess, in the world. And if Ivan would bring her to Tsar Arvon, he would be given the golden maned horse. In sadness, Prince Ivan returned to the gray wolf and confessed his mistake. The wolf sighed and consented to take him to Helen the Beautiful. After running for two days and nights, the wolf stopped under the tree and told Ivan to wait there. 
the gray wolf snuck into the palace and waited by the garden gate. Soon, Helen the Beautiful came out to walk in her palace. Before the maids had a chance to sound an alarm, the wolf jumped over the gate, grabbed Helen the Beautiful, and leapt back out of the garden and ran out of sight. Prince Ivan thought Helen was so beautiful and that he had fallen in love with her before they reached Tsar Arvan's palace. Friend wolf, he cried, I do not want to give up Helen the Beautiful for a horse with a golden mane and tail. What should I do? The gray wolf simply answered, trust me. He gave Ivan instructions and then changed himself into the form of a young woman, exactly like Helen the Beautiful. They walked into the Tsar's palace and Tsar Arvan was so happy that he gave Ivan the golden maned horse and the golden bridle. Ivan took the horse back to the tree where they had left Helen and they proceeded on to Tsar Dharmat's kingdom. After a time, Ivan missed his gray wolf and he called to him. The wolf appeared by the golden maned horse and Ivan joyfully leaped onto the wolf's back. Then they arrived at Tsar Dharmat's. Ivan was sad again. He told how the, the wolf how beautifully the horse suited Helen the Beautiful and how it would be a shame to give it up. The wolf again consented to help. The wolf changed himself into the golden maned horse and he and Prince Ivan went to Tsar Dharmat's palace. The Tsar was delighted and gave Ivan the firebird and the golden cage. Ivan took them back to Helen and the group again set out on their way. So far so good, right? Ivan started to miss his friend, the gray wolf, and he called for him. For several days, they all traveled together until they arrived at the palace where Prince Ivan's horse had fallen dead. Here, the gray wolf said he must leave them for he could be of no more use. Then he vanished. At this time, Ivan's brothers caught up to him. They were very jealous of their younger brothers, so they tied him to a tree and stole everything he had gained. The evil brothers left him for dead and took Ellen, the bird, and the horse as their own. For many days, Ivan was tied to the tree. He was almost dead and the crows were flying around him waiting for him to finally die so they could have dinner. Suddenly, the gray wolf appeared again. He made the crows fetch water for Ivan. They untied him, and when he was revived, he hopped on the wolf's back and raced for his father's palace. Ivan walked into the palace hall where his brothers were preparing to marry Helen the Beautiful. He threw open the doors to see the shocked faces of his brothers who had been sure he was dead. Helen ran to him crying, this is the one, this is the prince who won me. The Tsar embraced his son who he thought was dead. Helen the Beautiful told the Tsar the whole story and he learned that Ivan had not only brought home the Tsarina but the horse with the golden mane and tail and the firebird as well. The Tsar furiously ordered that his other sons be banished from the kingdom forever. He then ordered the feast to continue and in a short time, Prince Ivan and Helen the Beautiful were married. They lived happily ever after with the firebird in their garden and the golden maned horse in their stables. So a very happy ending in the Russian folk tale about Ivan and the firebird. So I hope that you enjoyed this week about the firebird. I'm also going to give you a link about how you can draw your own firebird. And if you do draw a firebird, I hope you post it so that we can all see and share in the fun. Have a good week and we'll see you next time. Bye-bye.